it's hard to argue that there isn't something special about the attachment between an infant and their primary caregiver, who's usually their biological mother. But what explains such a strong bond developing so quickly? Unsurprisingly, biological psychologists often argue this attachment bond is innate. Babies are primed with the need to attach to their mother figures, and in turn, the baby's caregivers have an innate response to care for them. Other psychologists would take a behaviorist perspective. In reality, babies just really need to be fed. And that's what they need to survive. And, well, they love mum, not because of anything special about her, but because she's just the best way to get food. And perhaps a parent's love for infants is more relief that that baby has finally stopped crying. So, let's dig a little deeper and compare these two very different explanations of attachment. The PsychBoost flashcard app has a new feature. Test yourself with over 1,500 multiple choice questions, including every topic on A-level and GCSE psychology. Try Paper 1 for free right now. And Patreon supporters can watch PsychBoost videos ad-free, learn from over 17 hours of exclusive exam tutorial videos, and access hundreds of digital and printable resources, including mind maps, quiz sheets, worksheets, teaching slides, and more. Explanations of attachment, learning theory. The first explanation for attachment is known as the cupboard love theory of attachment. It's a learning theory explanation using ideas you should be familiar with from behaviorism. If behaviorism is new to you, you might want to watch my behaviorism video first, but I'll tell you what you need to know for attachment right here. The cupboard love theory argues that babies become attached to their mothers as they learn that they provide food. This process is based on classical conditioning, learning by association. You can see here how classical conditioning works using the example of Pavlov's classic study. As a reminder, Pavlov found dogs would associate the sound of a neutral stimulus, like a metronome, with food, ultimately producing saliva in response to the sound of the metronome. Well, we can use the same diagram to explain the development of an attachment with classical conditioning. We start with mum as a neutral stimulus at first. The infant has no response to her over other adults. However, food is an unconditioned stimulus, producing the unconditioned response of pleasure. Unconditioned means the stimulus-response relationship is instinctual. It doesn't have to be trained. A hungry baby is naturally going to feel happy if you feed it. As the neutral stimulus of mum is always present when the infant is being fed, the infant learns an association between the mother and food. Mum then becomes a conditioned stimulus, producing the conditioned response of pleasure. At this point, the association is formed. We can also use operant conditioning to explain infant and caregiver behaviour. Operant conditioning is learning through patterns of reinforcement, and we can see examples of positive and negative reinforcement in attachment relationships. A quick reminder about positive and negative reinforcement. The word positive doesn't mean something good, it means adding a stimulus. And negative doesn't mean something bad, it means taking something away. As reinforcement means making behaviour more likely, if we want to increase the behaviour, we need to reward that behaviour by giving something nice, or by removing something unpleasant. There's also punishment, where behaviour is reduced by giving an unpleasant stimulus or removing a pleasant stimulus. But we don't need to discuss punishment to explain attachment. So going back to infant behaviour, where an infant cries and the parent provides milk, milk acts as a pleasant stimulus. It's positive reinforcement for crying behaviour, making the baby more likely to cry the next time it's hungry. We can also say the parent's behaviour is manipulated by crying, Crying is a very unpleasant stimulus, and of course, the baby stops crying when the parent provides care. This removal of an unpleasant stimulus works as negative reinforcement. The next time the baby cries, the parents will quickly give the baby what it needs to stop the crying. Behaviors distinguish between primary and secondary drives. Drives are the desire to complete an action. We don't need to learn primary drives, they're based on instinct, as they're required for survival and reproduction. So. We have primary drives of sleep, hunger, thirst, and sex. Secondary drives are learnt. We learn that secondary drives will ultimately satisfy a primary drive. Money is a secondary drive. On its own, it's useless. But we learn it can be used to satisfy a number of our primary drives. In this case, attachment is a secondary drive. Infants seek attachment with their mothers because they learn the mother will ultimately satisfy. So, reduce the primary drive of hunger. Evaluations. The first evaluation we can use is that learning theory makes intuitive sense. The idea that babies will cry to get attention and ultimately food 
seems to be obvious and matches our experience when it comes to infants. We can use the term face validity to describe a theory that makes intuitive sense. As a behaviorist theory, the basic principles behind cupboard love are supported by a large amount of well-controlled animal research, such as Pavlov for classical conditioning and Skinner for operant conditioning. But of course, large-scale, highly controlled conditioning research on human infants hasn't been conducted for ethical and, I guess, practical reasons, but mostly ethical. Our first criticism is environmental reductionism. While behaviorists argue that attachment is simply a learnt response due to associations and reinforcement, most parents would disagree, seeing that explanation of the attachment they have with their infants as overly simplistic. They would want to believe they consciously decided to care for their children, and their infants love them for more than just the food they provide. Harlow's research effectively counters cupboard love. If infants become attached to what feeds them, then the monkeys in Harlow's studies should have become attached to the wire mother that provided milk. Instead, the infant monkeys showed attachment behavior to the cloth mother, which provided comfort, but not food. Harlow's results suggest attachment is instead an instinctual need for comfort. For each explanation of attachment, we can suggest another explanation as a possible alternative. So in this case, Bobby's monotrophic theory is a convincing biological explanation for attachment that suggests infants and mothers have an instinctive drive to form close relationships. This explanation makes evolutionary sense as the caregiver provides security, and forming a strong relationship with the caregiver would increase the likelihood of survival. We can also point out that Balby's theory aligns more with Harlow's findings. Explanations of Attachment Balby's Monotrophic Theory Balby's Monotrophic Theory is an evolutionary perspective on attachment. Essentially, Balby believed that infants are naturally driven to form a particularly strong bond with their primary caregiver, which Balby argued was always their mother. He called this bond monotrophy. The idea is this bond is crucial for survival. After all, the caregiver is the main source of food and protection for the infant, so it would make evolutionary sense for babies and mothers to form attachment to each other. The mothers need to pass on their genes, and the babies need to survive. Babies are born with innate behaviours like crying, smiling and vocalising, which Bulby terms social releases. These are signals designed to draw the caregiver's attention. According to Balby, caregivers, especially mothers, are biologically prepared to respond to these signals, instinctively finding them either cute or alarming. Balby's views were inspired by Lorenz's studies on imprinting and Harlow's research with monkeys on the importance of touch and comfort. Lorenz found that goslings had a 32-hour window to form an attachment, or it wouldn't happen at all. Taking inspiration, Balby argued that humans have their own critical period for forming a primary attachment, and it's in the first 30 months after birth. He believed if this primary or monotrophic attachment doesn't form in the critical period, it could lead to lasting negative impacts on social, emotional, and intellectual development. Bobby was also inspired by Freud's emphasis on early childhood experiences and Harlow's monkey experiments. Bobby thought that the bond with their mother, the first relationship an infant has, sets the stage for all future relationships. A set of schema is formed called an internal working model. Think of it as a relationship blueprint. It shapes how we perceive relationships later on, guiding our beliefs on whether people are trustworthy or if expressions of love are normal behaviours in relationships. Balby was interested in the strength of the monotrophic relationship. He suggested consistent care of infants results in a stronger attachment bond. But if there are frequent or prolonged separations, the bond becomes disrupted. According to Balby, the strength of the monotrophic attachment can be observed by looking for what's called safe base behaviour. When infants have a solid attachment, they confidently explore their surroundings, but always use their mother as a sort of home base, frequently returning for reassurance. And if she goes missing or a stranger comes in, you'll see the baby getting anxious and distressed. Evaluations We know Bobby was deeply influenced by Lorenzo's studies on geese, particularly the idea of a critical period for attachment. However, care should be taken when extrapolating animal research directly to humans. For instance, there's been studies with orphans who have experienced an extreme form of maternal deprivation. The results of these studies indicated that while there's a sensitive period for attachment, it's not as rigid as in geese. Despite Bulby's claim about irreversible harm, significant recovery is possible with appropriate care. Bulby has made significant contributions to the field of attachment research. Not only did he pave the way for other important researchers like Mary Ainsworth, but his theories also reshaped early childcare practices. 
These days, there's an emphasis on the importance of immediate physical contact between mothers and their newborns. Also, social service professionals take cases of neglect very seriously. As they understand the potential long-term effects of mistreatment, Bobby's theory has faced criticism for perpetuating gender biases, particularly alpha bias, which exaggerates the differences between genders. According to Bobby, fathers primarily serve as providers, while mothers play an indispensable monotrophic role. Such a perspective is arguably a product of 1940s society. The concept of monotrophy doesn't really hold up well today, especially with the evolving dynamics of modern families, where mothers are working, and caregiving responsibilities are shared between parents and other caregivers. Remember, we can use the counter theory as evaluation. There are alternative theories to Bobby's evolutionary perspective. Behaviorist covered love theory argues infants become attached to their mothers mainly because they associate them with food, resulting in feelings of comfort and pleasure. And there have been a large number of rigorous experiments that have validated the principles behind behaviorism. Bobby's concept of the internal working model could be seen as deterministic, as it leads to the continuity hypothesis that the quality of an infant's attachment can predict adult relationship patterns. The idea that our early infancy might dictate our future relationship behaviours challenges the common belief that individuals have autonomy over their relationships and are responsible for the outcomes of those relationships. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. And a special thank you to Kat Posnick and Ahmed Romani for supporting at the developer level. I do have extra resources that are exclusive to my patrons. So if you decide to sign up, you can grab those over my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos, of course, including questions on the attachment unit. I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you in the next Psych Boost video. 